live. Can you hear me? If you can hear me, put a heart in the chat so that I know that you can hear me. Um, otherwise, I'd never know if anybody can hear me. So if you can hear me, just drop a heart. <laughs> um, hey, Leanne, so you can hear me. Okay, perfect. So I want to jump in because I'd gone a few days and I did not actually come in and... Um, what do you call it, go live. I did it the other day very quickly, but I kind of got off my little streak again and I could feel the anxiety also building up with that process. And since it's a muscle I'm trying to build, you kind of have to keep doing it if you want it to keep getting better. And as I stated before, like in wig wearing or anything else, if you stop with something that you have so much anxiety, it's gonna be very easy for you to regress. So I had like that pain like right before I was like oh, I don't know and for some reason particularly if I use if I'm set up here like I have a better camera here it's a little bit more anxiety provoking than if I'm and I'm feeding it into the computer to record it I, it's a little bit more anxiety provoking than if it's like outside or on the roof for some reason but I want to be comfortable in all scenarios hey Bonnie um, so I wanted to talk about what I thought was really important, which was the very short reel that I posted yesterday um, when I said I present a wig looking like a wig and who effing cares sometimes, you know, and sometimes you just have to get busy living. I think the reel was confusing to some people because they thought, I don't get it because the wig looks real or real to them. The thing is, in our own life and when we're wearing our hair, we can see when it looks like a wig. I Every almost I would say 99% of the footage that was taken from me yesterday of from my amusement park trip, it, I look like I'm wearing a wig to my own eyes. Like I'm not fooling anybody that has any level of, you know, wig wearing skill in the public. They'd be like, I see you girl. And that would be fine. My point is, is I knew before leaving the house that my wig was in for it that day. I picked a wig that wasn't washed. I knew it was going to be blown all over the place. And I knew that those photos and videos was gonna be me looking at it and being like, there I am in a wig. But the thing is with the wig, I've accepted that it can't look perfect at all aspects of my life and in all scenarios. It's very easy, by the way, to get on Instagram and see, People taking pictures and videos, and I'm not saying they're trying to like uh, manipulate anything. It's just that we all want to look our best. So I'm not. So it's very easy to structure a photo in a way where you're hiding the the wigisms of a wig. Um, I think every wig wearer knows how to do that if they've been doing it long enough, and you see that the realness of it also in the rawness of the photos when you go out and you're with family and friends and they're snapping those things you're like wait a second that wasn't the angle you know that's not the right angle looking a little thick on the top parts looking a little too tight this isn't you know this is not exactly how it was in front of my window with my ring light what the hell is going on here because one there's a couple things going on there one one is that it should be it's worth noting for people that the human eye Okay, like people walking this earth, they don't have camera pickup capabilities, just so you know. So when you see yourself, you dress yourself in the morning and you go out in your wig, you see how you look, okay, with your eyeballs, okay? This is accurate. This is not a misrepresentation. But what happens is the camera, cameras pick up things the human eye never would. The lighting of certain scenarios pick up things that the human eye never would, like lighting in certain bathrooms, of passing by a reflection, start maybe seeing something dome over or dome up. Like the human eye is looking at you and people are taking you in as a person. They're seeing you as a whole. Think about your life before hair loss. Like if you were me, like, I mean, I, I didn't look at people and their hair. I just looked at the person. I was looking at them as the, their totality. That's how people, unless they have hair loss themselves, that's how they're looking at you. And even in, when they are looking, again, the human eye does not pick up nearly as much as a camera and reflections 
with lighting in weird bathroom situations. So if you leave your house and you look amazing and you're like, I look great today, and you caught yourself at the bank reflection mirror or on the checkout stand at CVS when they shove that thing in your face, and you're like, what the hell is this? Who threw a wig on my head? I just want you to know that's normal because it is a wig on your head. And so there are going to be certain variables and certain conditions that will pick that, pick that up. That does not mean you don't look good in your wig, by the way. And that took me a little bit of time to come to grips with and a little bit of time to be okay with because I wanted to look exactly as I wanted to look at all points of the day for the, you know, if I have to wear a wig, why can't it be perfect? Why can't it be the density I want? Why can't it be the color I want? And in every single aspect of life, why can't it look exactly as my bio hair looked and behaved before hair loss? And the answer to that is because it can't. It's a wig. And if you're like me, you have female pattern baldness and it's progressive and that can never be a thing. So you have to come to terms with the progressiveness of the hair loss, the limitations within that. But it's not that you can't live with it. It's that you have to be willing to work with it. You have to be willing to like, like I said, I went out yesterday. First of all, I'm prepping for this thing. I am not somebody that's equipped to be walking all day in the heat. I'm someone that swells like a beast, even in my air conditioned area here. Most people probably see me wearing a sweater all the time. And I live in Los Angeles. That's because I keep my place like a meat locker for my skin, for my inf inflammatory issues. For me to be walking around, and I think I have a circ circulatory issue as well, where the water tends to like go down to my legs and they turn into tree stems. I'm like, so I plan for my, I got some joggers on that are loose joggers. I don't like wearing kind of loose pants, never love that. I never wear sneakers, got my sneakers on. I got I threw a dirty wig on because why not? I'm like, this thing is gonna look like crap all day anyway, so who cares? And you know what? I'm planning for the day to be as comfortable as I can to enjoy the day for the purpose of which the purpose was intended. I don't like amusement parks. I wanted to spend time with my nieces, my brother, and my mother. I lost my father in 2022. And I want to spend as much time as humanly possible with my loved ones. And if an opportunity presents itself, despite the fact that I'm not the best person to be running around an amusement park, swelling like a beast. It had nothing to do with my wig. The wig was the least of my problems, trust me. And I would have actually gone with no wig at all, but I don't have enough hair to not get a burn on my scalp. And then I also don't like how I look with the ball cap and, you know, no hair. So the wig was still, the wig looking like a wig was still a better option to me. And it's one I can live with. But I went to the bathroom multiple times in the amusement park. Hello, hello, wig staring at me again. Oh, there's another photo we took. But you know what? It's okay. You know why it's okay? It's one, I've gotten used to it. One, I've accepted it. I've also accepted that the majority of people that were hanging out at this place, not that they, I care anyways what they think, they're running around with their Mickey Mouse ears. They're doing their whole thing. They're enjoying their lives. They're enjoying their families. They are not concerned that there's a wig on my head or that I'm swelling like a beast. They're concerned about themselves and their families. We tend to forget that about this whole process, when we are obsessing, when we are obsessing about ourselves and our wig and what other people will think, and we're not busy living our life because of our hair loss, the only one in that that's losing is us. It's not the other person. It wasn't the, all the other people with the Mickey Mouse ears. If I chose not to go because I was going to swell up, or if I chose not to go because I was going to look like I was going to be wearing a wig in every single photo that would be immortalized from here to the end of time, I lose. And I already lost over a decade of my life to hair loss. And before that, I was losing life before hair loss because I had other issues. Enough of my life, and I'll be 46 years old next week, has been lost to issues that I have been dealing with. Hair loss being a huge one. And the one thing I want to impart on people is that as that reel was meant to be, when I, trust me, maybe other people don't see it. All I see in that the, the roller coaster uh, video, that is like wig to the nth degree. Like it's like, I couldn't be screaming more wig if I tried. Maybe some people don't see it that way, but I see it that way. And it's okay. The footage wasn't mainly of me, by the way. It was of everybody else in the, you know, the, the, uh, the coaster with us, my family and all of that, but I'm not gonna put my family online. But 
it was fun. It was great to see my nieces have a great time. Every time a photo was taken and it looked like a wig, it wasn't like I was like, my God, here we are with my wig again. No, it wasn't like here we are with my tree stump legs swelling up as I walk through this thing as I'm turning swollen and red. No, it was about the fact that I was not letting any of my issues keep me from living my life. And this talk could be about hair loss right now, but this talk could be about anybody's issue that they have in their life that they that holds them up from living because I'll do it when, I'll do it then, I'll do it if, I'll do it, you know, all of these, these ifs, wins at some point in time, I promise you, I've done it a million times over. I always think it's interesting when somebody sometimes online, it happens, likes to impart their opinions on my wigs or tell me that that one doesn't look that good on you or that one's not so great or this one's that, that and the other thing. Trust me, I promise you when I tell you this, whatever you're seeing, I see 10,000 times more. Whatever I'm doing, I'm doing for a reason. However I do it, it's so that I can live. You know, it's like, it's something else I never understood about online, like commenting on other people's wigs in a negative regard to be like, oh, that one's, that one needs a haircut. They need help. Or, you know, that one's not, not that one's not as good as your other ones. I'm living this, I'm living this life. This is my hair loss. This is my wig life. And this wasn't a choose option A through D. I'm purchasing a wig and tell me what you think. This was, this is my life and this is what I'm doing. And I'm hoping that other people can get from that the awareness or the strength or the ability and the willingness to live beyond the issues. Like I said, live beyond my swelling uh, allergic, bloating, water retained, wig looking mess at the amusement park because what matters is the time that we have here. This time, we're never going to get back. Do you think that I'm going to look on yesterday? Like, I'm still like, I'm coming down in my, my f swollenness, but I'm not, no, what was did, yesterday was April 20th. It won't go down in the books as the day Auntie swelled up at the amusement park and you know, turned red and we, maybe her legs were turned into tree stumps, you know, cause they were paying attention to that. Not, um, oh, wait a second. I think auntie's wig looked more like a wig. None of that was going to matter to my nieces. None of that mattered to my brother. None of that mattered to my mother. As a matter of fact, I asked my niece if she really wanted to go on a ride, which by the way, I hate roller coasters, but if she really wanted to, I said, I will go on that one, that particular one. And I said, I'm going to all just have grandma hold my hair. If you want to go, I'll go. That one I'll, I would have taken my hair off for, okay? That's where we are. We are needing to live our lives, to enjoy our lives for the things that matter and for the things that count. And that's a challenge to rise above the things that hold us down. For There are different issues for different people. I got different issues other than hair loss. I have a very challenging issue with needing things to be exact, needing perfection, that's a very, that's a hard one. I know that oftentimes people don't understand me. I can even make a reel about not being understood. And in that reel, I would be misunderstood. That is just the way that it is. It's a hard challenge for me, but I have to realize that, you know, we're all different. Nobody walks in each other's shoes. Nobody can get exactly every single ism that I've had or that I came into this world with or that my environment shaped. I have to be able to roll with it. I have to be able to work with it. And for me to be able to have done that, or me to be able to even sit here and turn on the camera again with the anxiety and to have this conversation with you on this matter, on hair loss, on wearing wigs, on wearing a wig on a day that you know that's going to look like a wig. It, to me, being the most resistant person that has ever existed, I have to believe that to be true. The upper percentile of this, I know to be true. That means for every single woman that is struggling out there, for every single woman that can't get out of bed today, for every single woman that can't see tomorrow because of their hair loss, for every single woman that can't get their wig right, because trust me, I struggle in trying to get my wigs right. It means that there is hope. It means that there's possibility. It means that, yes, you can go to the amusement park and not worry that you're swelling out like a tree trunk with a wig on your head and have fun with your friends and have friends with your family and your children and make memories that are gonna matter. Because the memories that won't matter are staying home. The memories that won't matter are all the canceled invitations that I did for over a decade of my life. 
day in and day out, becoming a hermit, becoming a recluse, becoming withdrawn to the point that I need a therapy to basically reintegrate into society. You know, those are the things that we have to think about. So that's what I came on here to say. <laughs> I didn't read any of this chat, by the way. Um, but if anybody has any questions, I'm going to scroll up right now to see what I didn't see. Um, hey, Yomo, I'm going to see what I didn't see here. Um, I see Joni says truth and I'm guilty of it too. I'll do it when not ripping on people. I missed something here. The tree. Oh my gosh, you have tree stump legs. That's me. I am so I have a circulatory issue. It's, it doesn't matter. I can be in a completely, completely air conditioned facility. And, you know, that's why I'm often in a long sleeve or sweater in LA because of my apartment is like a locker box, like a freezer box because, and I often have my feet up whenever I can have them because my lower extremities swell to the nth degree. They look like completely different legs. They start one way, they end one way. And before someone starts to tell me about my diet or my exercise, Trust me when I tell you that if anybody has looked more into diet and exercise to the point that they almost had that as a career where I almost exercise almost for a living, competing, learning all about nutrition, I've done this to the nth degree. I happen to have an issue. It doesn't, it's not great. It's kind of like rosacea in the regard of it is what it is. And I just kind of have to work with that situation. One of those things is my legs turning into tree stumps at the end of the day. It's not optimal. That's for sure. Um, let's see here. Marissa says, I never thought, I never thought I would ever wear a wig. After following you for a year, I got the courage to get my first wig. That makes me so happy to hear. It makes me so happy to hear. If I've been able to help somebody be able to process this process every single time, it's never lost on me on how big of a deal this is and how hard it is. And even with like the shaving the head, which is definitely not for everybody. You know, some women were on that fence where they actually wanted to do that in their life. And so me sharing that part of my journey, it helped them to make that next change for themselves in that regard. And even some women didn't even have to shave their head. They made the change in thinking and knowing they wanted to cut some off, but couldn't do it. So it was like, it's just grabbing what you can from what's around you, whether it's from something that you read, whether it's from something that you see, all of the little nuggets you can absorb to help you just get to the next level. Level up. We don't go down levels. If I talked about that before, as you know, we level up. Every single thing we do gets us stronger in this process. Trust me, it really does. Oh, thank you, Spencer. He said, you look tiny to me when you came into my studio, unbelievably fit. Um, so my legs had not swollen by that point. <laughs> But I really appreciate it. But they're usually concealed anyways because of, you know, my jeans or whatever. Throw boots over it and you really conceal the whole calf inflation. Um, AWJC55 AWJC says, my feet swell dreadfully in the heat. Yeah, it's like a nightmare. <laughs> I was in for it yesterday. I was in, I had a fanny pack and the whole thing, by the way. I was... <laughs> This was not a day for, it wasn't like, this is the day I'm going to look my best. You know, I'm going to wander Disneyland looking amazing. I got a fanny pack. I got some joggers. <clears throat> I got some sneakers. I don't know how old they are because I only use them for exercising. I don't wear sneakers in life. It was like wiggy homeless chic was the vibe I was going for. Comfort, <laughs> you know, being able to just enjoy the time that I was there for what I was there for, not worrying about the fact that my wig looks like a wig and I'm swelling like a beast. Um, so I'm scrolling up here. So they didn't see this when I came, when I was talking. So Joni says, I've thought about clipping extensions for my niece's wedding, small level up. That It is a level up. A clipping extension is great. Anything that we can do to help ourselves feel better is a big deal. There's no one way that anybody has to address this. There's no one wig. There's no one brand. There's no one type of wig. There's no one, you know, for any brand that says that they're universally going to work for everybody, I believe is 
not being really honest because I just don't think that's a thing. I think some people do things better than other people. Some people, you know, just work in different capacities. And I think that you have to find what works for you. I don't think there's any one brand or any one type of wig or any one type of hair system that will ever work universally for every single person. And that's for a number of reasons. It's beyond just what the vendor's doing. It also has to do with what we can deal with. What is our capability in dealing with this? Can you work in a more of a customized process? Do you have the patience for that? Um, do you need something that is more stocked? Do you need it more ready? Um, who you are working with matters. I can say that from now until the cows come home. Who you are working with matters to me tremendously. That is an integral part of this process. I do not believe I could have accepted wigs in my life at the point that I did in 2012 if it was not for the woman that was helping me out. Yeah, the product was good. I'm not taking away from that. But her care, her help, that made all the difference. That was a make it or break it. You could have the best product on the planet and your personal, what, how, how you interact with your clients just sucks and you make them feel like crap and you don't have any care and compassion. I don't care how good your product is. You, that would be crushing to the person that is going to be wearing your piece and also making it your piece not a viable option for that person, but also maybe crushing their ability to wear hair in the future or for quite some time or be willing to try it again for quite some time. So my message to vendors is always, you know, have the care. Know your audience. You are dealing with women that have essentially, if you're they're dealing with androgenetic alopecia or another form of hair loss, feel like they've lost a limb. That is what they're looking to replace. That is a big effing deal. This is no small thing. So if you're choosing to sell hair to women with hair loss, you have to be willing to up your own game, your own customer service, your own care and compassion, your own understanding, and not treat this like a business of selling, you know, water. Because it's a water while essential to life. It's a little bit different. So, you know, that's my little rant on that because I just don't think it's done enough. I just think, a lot of vendors treat this process like, you know, eh, like, you know, it's doesn't, it's not given the respect that it deserves with the person that's going to you to help you to potentially help them in restoring their life. They're paying you to do this. They're paying you for a product. And for that, you know, I think that care and compassion should come along with the service. Call me crazy. I don't know. I'm weird like that. So here it says, do you know any of any females that had successful hair transplant? I'm a candidate after meeting two surgeons, including IHRS surgeon. I'd like to have the surgery, but still researching. Um, so, you know, if you were told you were a candidate for a hair transplant because like 98% of women with androgenetic alopecia are not candidates, I have to assume that you have a very, 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 very stable donor area because you have to have a stable donor area in order for them to do a successful transplant. You can't have hair that's falling out from all over this, all over your scalp um, because when it's moved, it just has a high probability of falling out again. So you must be in the two percentile of women that have a very stable donor area. My suggestion to Tammy uh, Dawn is I would suggest that you call on Friday night, Spencer Coburn does a show at 3 p.m. with Joe Tillman, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. It's live on YouTube. It's at Spencer Coburn. You could follow him there and call in. Ask their opinion. It's great that you're getting doctor's assessments, but if you were me, I would get all of the assessment. That means also they're professionals in this. They got no dog in the race. So if you want to get a little bit more education on transplantation and if you would be a candidate, in their opinion, I would also take the time to actually call their show for sure. Um, it's reading here. Question about paying for a consultation at a wig or hair salon. What is the question about paying for consultation at a wig or hair salon? So I have my opinion on paying for consultations. I'll just say this. I always have to say this when I do these lives with this camera, which I record so that I can possibly put them on YouTube for people on my YouTube audience and anybody that wants it on the replay. So 
this thing will cut out when it starts to heat up and there are lights around so it tends to cut off so if i go dark on you usually it switches to the the macbook but if i just go dark you know maybe i'll pick up the phone and log in from there if i haven't cut off yet um but i do have an opinion on the uh paying for consultation so for me but i have this opinion across the board for when i see doctors and stuff like that so the way i think about it is this i feel like sometimes you know when you get something for free and someone's gonna give you a free consultation it's like they're because it's also because like they're wanting to sell i'm not saying that's always the case i'm just like yeah, there's this thing that they're going to sell you something that's just me by the way i'm not saying it's always the case with every single person and some people have free consultations and that's not a bad thing but i feel not bad about like i'm not discouraged when someone says they have a consultation for like a wig consultation my very first appointment by the way in 2012 it did have a wig consultation fee at the time it was a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars that was going to go to towards the wig if i purchased a wig but uh, that was in 2012. But I feel like with anybody, whether it's an attorney, whether it's a doctor, I actually like paying for the consultation because then I don't feel like there's a pressure to buy. I feel like I'm paying for your time. So we can take the time to figure out all of the things that I have to ask. If you know we're trying something on, I'm not feeling like I'm sucking up your time. And then at the end of the day, I'm not going to buy anything. I have less pressure to feel like I'm going to buy something when I'm paying for your time. And I may find something and it may work out. Now, some people will apply that consultation fee to the wig and some people will not. So it just depends on the person. But I personally don't have a problem paying for consultations because of that reason. I feel like there's less pressure to feel like you have to buy something. But plenty of people do do free consultations and I don't want to put them in a negative light. I'm not saying that's a negative situation at all at either. I'm just saying that for me, I don't have a problem with paid consults. Um, I see Jerry Lynn wrote here, I had a transplant, it didn't work. And that is something that I have to say that I've talked about transplants quite a number of times in the regard of sharing with women that they are typically not candidates with female pattern baldness. And every single time I've done it, nearly every single time I've done it on Instagram and on YouTube, and in stories, women come out and share their story. They were not a candidate. They were told they were a candidate. They were the the doctor knew that they weren't a candidate. In my opinion, there's no way they could not have known they were not a candidate. Um, and they were. There are plenty of doctors that are going to be willing to go ahead and operate on you, take your money, potentially leave you scarred in a couple of places, um, leave you worse off than you were before, limiting your options on also shaving your head, um, and leaving you like feeling like like you lost one other kind of piece of like this is not an option you know when they should have told you from the beginning that it wouldn't be an option so they don't leave you worse off than you began and i feel like you know when when you do something and it's like we did it to ourselves it's like when i took the birth control pill and this is not a really good example but i lived for a long time feeling like i did this to myself i gave myself hair loss if it wasn't for me taking the birth control pill, which I had no idea could possibly cause female pattern baldness if you had a genetic predisposition, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't have, I, I did this is what I'm trying to say. I was like, I got distracted, but I lived thinking I did this to myself. I'm the one that caused my hair loss. Had I not taken the pill, I wouldn't be in the position that I was in, but I had no other information. So how was I to know that I had a genetic predisposition predispos and how was I to know that the birth control pill could potentially kick that in. I wasn't given that information. That wasn't my fault. But I did live for a very, very, very long time feeling terrible about myself. I was like, I did this to myself. This erosion of self, I did this to myself. Now, when you put yourself out there to do something like a transplant and you're not a candidate and a doctor is willing to operate on you and you have a bad result, I feel like you're going to end up in that kind of situation again, similarly, although in that particular situation, again, they should give you the information, but it's like you caused yourself more harm while you were trying to help yourself. You're trying to do good for yourself and you're hurting yourself more. And to me, that's like, it made it harder for me to actually live with hair loss, having that hanging over my head, you know? So I believe it's a disservice for doctors that are willing to operate on women that are not candidates because you're not just taking their money. 
this happens in Wigland and women are taken advantage of left and right. And at the end of the day, maybe you got a box of rocks and a messed up wig. And I'm not saying that's not crushing, but your hair, your head wasn't cut open and you weren't scarred. We can come back from that. Once you get cut, you know, Spencer Coben says you're cut. So that's something you have to be very careful with. Um, bedside manner. I don't know what they what they were referring to, but bedside manner is so important. <laughs> when you see your dermatologist, I, I feel like so many don't have bedside manner. I don't know. That's not taught in school. They're very cold. You know, I told you about the experience going to a dermatologist in November 2022. This is with a doctor that, you know, I won't name because I do think she's respected, you know, she's respected and I don't think she like has a bad diagnostic skills, but kind of cold and very, you know, callous here about like, you know, the way this whole thing was handled, not really understanding I'm coming in, coming in at this with over two decades of hair loss, not understanding why I'm wearing wigs, suggesting that I don't wear the wigs. Like, you know, maybe that's not good for your scalp. Telling her that I've got folliculitis because I have to shave my head. And she's like, well, I think maybe you should just not shave your head. Again, I have to shave my head for hair loss. I have to wear a wig for hair loss. So these are not, not options. So you're not really getting me. That's not to say, even to point out, like when I came in there, being so insecure and vulnerable at the state that I was in because I was lost so much hair, not only after over two decades of hair loss, but getting a second hair loss, having mug shots taken of me, standing against a white wall, feeling like so small and tiny because of what was happening to my head at that point in time. Face left, pull your hair back, to the right, to the left, turn around, spread your hair, as I've said a million times over, I would have rather been on a, a teaching school, you know, gynecological working space, all male audience for five hours spread eagle. The reason why is because I don't have any issues with my vagina. It didn't traumatize me. I got issues with my head. There's a there's actually a difference. And I don't I'm not even trying to be funny. Like one caused me trauma, the other one did not. So it maybe it has caused trauma for some women, but that one did not. So yeah, I would have preferred the spread eagle on a gynecological table than you telling me to spread my hair, you know, as I'm coming in here, you know, so withdrawn, so devastated after getting a second hair loss, looking like a creature on my head, you know, that's not great, you know, so, so the bedside manner is definitely huge. And then they took one of the photos, by the way just to boot, just just so as an added treat. As I logged into the portal one day to go look at my appointment system, guess what one of the photos is of me? The, my photo, the, the photo of me that represents my profile icon, it's from day one of me going there, like looking completely with my head distorted because of the way that it was falling out, like three strands on each side, flattened you know, to the core with a carved out temple, looking like way worse than with a shaved head, by the way. That's why I said the shaved head's better. That's my icon, my profile icon for this healthcare center. Like, hello, you know, maybe, you know, ask me for a different photo or maybe use an emoji or something like that. Like, not great. I'm just scrolling down here. Hey, Spencer says he's here. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Wendy. Um, and he, yeah, he said like maybe 2% make candidates for a hair transplant. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I'm paying for their time. As far as the consultations, no sales pressure. A lot of people, women feel like they have to buy something if they're taking up their time. They took an hour with you or whatever they took with you. So I'm going to have to buy something where they feel bad because it's a weird thing. Hair is a weird thing, you know, and it, we're, we're already coming in at this really insecure. So we're already in the negative and in the red with how we're coming in on this. We're not coming in really strong, you know, we're coming in on the low. So we have a high probability of possibly being taken advantage of. Scrolling down here. Diane Lynn says, I coached my daughters to get off the birth control after hearing your story. Knowledge is power and we don't know what we don't know. And that's exactly it. We don't know what we don't know. And I'm not here to tell anybody what they should do with their birth control pill life. I'm just here to say that 10,000% destroyed. Like, I don't know what my life would have looked like. And I, as we, you know, it took over 10 years to try to get back to myself. But while everybody was living in their 20s and while everybody was having a life, 
I was crying my eyeballs out. I was pacing my hair on the shower wall like an abacus, counting it out. I was watching myself erode in the mirror. I was floundering without any resources and not knowing what to do. I couldn't get out of the shower because I was so stuck in tears. I, all my hair just fell out. So for me, the birth control pill 10,000% destroyed a huge portion of my life. I don't even know what my life would have looked like actually if I didn't take it. It would have looked different. I can guarantee you that. It made me more, I already had social anxiety and I already had anxiety. It gave me more social anxiety. It made me more of a recluse. It made me more have an inability to function in the world because I got so withdrawn that I no longer could, you know, do the simple things that everybody else doesn't have a problem with, you know, sitting in a Starbucks or whatever, you know, shopping at weird hours so I wouldn't have to see anybody. That was hair loss. Hair loss made me a recluse. So my birth control pill situation is, for me, that thing is like, people gotta be fully informed about that, their possibility, their genetic predisposition, all of the risks associated associated with it, and are you willing to take that risk? And if you are, and in your life, then there's no problem. It's good. I'm all for informed decisions, but you, we have to have the information. I don't think that information is given out as freely as it should be, you know? Let's see, and I think, Diane, you're referring to how callous dermatologists are in their you know, I would go to my appointments, by the way, at this place and at this dermatologist's office. Again, I'm not going to name the name, but like there's a thin door, I guess, between this office and the next. And I'd be there for my appointment waiting to be, you know, have a Q-tip go through my head and examine and take my mug shots. And I could hear the doctor in the door over next door just shooting the shit shooting the shit about vacation and what so-and-so was up to this it did not sound like this was by the way a patient it sounded like somebody that worked there like some a, like a co-worker or somebody that worked for her and i'm like here i am sitting waiting for this thing like waiting for this thing to be over you know pump full of xanax to go to my appointment and i'm listening to something about golfing in the next room i don't think that's great you know just saying Um, so yeah, so I think I, I don't, I don't know if I commented on everything, but yeah, that is really what I came on here to discuss. That is really what I came on here to say. So if anybody has any questions about anything, I will be happy to answer. But if not, we're at 30, I think we're at 37 minutes, which means my camera will probably shut off and my face will probably start overheating we both overheat at the same time but um i'm happy to answer any anybody anybody else's questions if they do have any uh spencer says i did my best to live my life booze helped i guess and of course turning my nightmare into into my career and there is you know and i have to thank him and i always do every single time because he's the only person that i found in 1999 and I did write him a very, very, very long email. I'm sure by now people have realized I don't, brevity is not my, you know, forte in length of writing or in speaking. Um, and I wrote probably a very long email about just wanting help. I had found his book, The Truth About Women's Hair Loss. He did not have to write me back. This is the AOL dial-up days. And he wrote me back trying to give some advice. He did not have to do that. He's been doing that forever and for free without any charge to the public for care of wanting to help people. And if, we're not, if not for what he did, I would not have started the Women's Hair Loss Project in 2007 because that is where I got the idea was seeing what he had done for men in helping them. He was on the radio, you know, and I put mine online, but that is what gave me the idea to do that or create something, to create a space for women that didn't exist. That is so. Spencer knows how much I love him and, you know, always will have the utmost respect and appreciation for everything that he's done for, for men, women, and for this industry as a whole. So that is all I have to say about that. Um, so I think right now I'm probably going to end this live oh, because I know this thing is going to shut off me. It's going to go black. I may pop in later on, um, from my roof, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for joining this live. Um, I always appreciate when you join me in this. It's still not the, you know, 
it's not a complete anxiety free process to do this, but I do love being able to communicate in this manner. I do love if it touches one person's life in that day when they're watching it in that moment. I do love if it can make the slightest bit of difference between you going to dinner tonight or not going to dinner tonight or what you're going to do next week or what you're going to do next month. Sometimes we need to hear one thing in that one moment just to get us to the next moment. And for that reason, you know, I appreciate everybody greatly for being here and I love you all. Bye.